Now, rumors of a cover-up started with Marilyn's close friends right after she died. No one believed that she chose to down 40-some pills. And get this, none of the capsules were found in her stomach only hours later. Did a potential love affair with JFK and his brother Bobby lead to her demise? Did the CIA or the mafia take her out to get revenge on the Kennedys? Did she know too much about aliens or other top secret government subjects? Or was Marilyn Monroe among the first in a long line of opioid deaths that have plagued the country since the days of black and white movies? Only a handful of people can say they know for 100% certainty what happened to Marilyn Monroe on the night of August 4th, 1962. And they're all dead. Otherwise, all we have is a bottomless rabbit hole of sources, theories, notes, phone calls, pictures, videos, reports, drugs, and money that try to answer the same question. Who killed Marilyn Monroe? Before we dive into the theory surrounding Marilyn's mysterious death, let's unpack the official narrative they want us to believe. On August 4th, Marilyn called her psychiatrist, a Beverly Hills doctor, Ralph Greenson, who had several film stars like her under his care. She wasn't feeling great after a phone call from a close friend of the Kennedys warning her to stay away from Jack and Bobby. Dr. Greenson got Marilyn to calm down after a few hours of therapy. She was already taking a lot of drugs. We're talking amphetamines to keep herself slim and attentive, barbiturates to help her sleep and take the edge off. She wanted to walk down Santa Monica Pier, but Greenson advised against it. Instead, he insisted that the housekeeper just take her for a drive. Marilyn called it a night around 8 p.m. She put on some Frank Sinatra records. She called a few friends to see who was up. Around 3 a.m., the housekeeper noticed that Marilyn's bedroom light was still on and the music still playing. She knocked, but Marilyn didn't answer. They called Dr. Greenson, afraid something bad had happened. And when he arrived, he broke into Marilyn's room through the window and found the actress naked face down on her bed. There were empty pill bottles scattered around the room including anti-anxiety medications and sedatives. She wasn't breathing, but she still had the phone clenched in her hand. Marilyn's primary physician, Hyman Engelberg, arrived just before 4 a.m. and pronounced her dead. The toxicology report found lethal levels of prescription drugs in her body. And based on her history with mental health and therapy, they called her death a probable suicide. She was only 36 when she died, but Marilyn kept an updated will in case something happened. She wasn't married, she didn't have any kids, and she died with a net worth of about $800,000, maybe $7 million in today's money. But this is bizarre. Through an odd chain of death, marriage, and inheritance, the bulk of Marilyn Monroe's estate ended up in the hands of an unknown 28-year-old Venezuelan actress named Anna Mizrahi. Here's what happened. So Marilyn left all her physical property and 75% of her intellectual property to her acting coach, Lee Strasberg. She always saw Lee and his wife Paula as her surrogate parents, although she did leave 100,000 to the care of her estranged mother. According to Anthony Summers, author of Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe, the Strasbergs took Marilyn under their wings and gave her privacy and companionship. Now, Paula died of cancer in 1966, and a year later, Lee remarried Anna Mizrahi. But when Lee died in 1982, Anna inherited everything he owned, including Marilyn Monroe's image and likeness. Now, reports claim Anna made millions of dollars in licensing revenue in the year since, selling Marilyn Monroe usage rights to brands like Coca-Cola, Mercedes-Benz. At the end of the day, Anna had the most to gain from Marilyn's death, but that doesn't mean she had something to do with it. They never met. Anna just stumbled into the right person at the right time. The best conspiracy theories surrounding Marilyn's death concern those with something to lose, like President Kennedy and his brother, acting U.S. Attorney General Robert Kennedy. There are a few conflicting stories about when Marilyn and JFK first met, According to Vanity Fair, they met in November 1961 while she visited the Santa Monica home of Peter Lawford, a fellow actor and JFK's brother-in-law. However, one biographer, James Spada, says Peter introduced the two in 1954. According to Esquire, most Maryland historians believe they met in March of 1962 
at a party at Bean Crosby's house. In Don Spoto's book, Marilyn Monroe, The Biography, he writes about a conversation between Marilyn and her personal masseuse, Ralph Roberts. According to him, Marilyn called him from Bing Crosby's party asking for massage advice, as one does. And he swears he heard President Kennedy's voice and he even spoke to him briefly. Now, Marilyn assured him that this party was her only affair with JFK. However, the most public display of any relationship between Marilyn and JFK was her sensual rendition of Happy Birthday on May 19th, 1962 at the President's Madison Square Garden birthday party. So was Norma Jean just playing a character that night? Or were there some romantic undertones to that song? And when JFK finally took the stage, he said, I can now retire from politics after having Happy Birthday sung to me in such a sweet and wholesome way. Mm Mm-hmm. In an interview with People magazine, her biographer, James Spada, touched on Marilyn's other political relationships. He said it was pretty clear that Marilyn had had sexual relations with both Bobby and Jack. There's also speculation that Robert Kennedy was at Marilyn's house the day she died. The Bobby Kennedy topic came up in 1983 when biographer Anthony Summers sat down with the BBC and Marilyn's housekeeper, Eunice Murray, the same housekeeper who knocked on her door in that early morning hour of August 5th, 1962. And apparently, Eunice put her head in her hands off camera and said, why do I have to keep covering this up? Anthony asked what she meant, and Eunice replied, of course Bobby Kennedy was there. Of course there was an affair with Bobby Kennedy. Well, she would know. And as long as we're talking about the housekeeper, why was she washing the movie star sheets right after the body was found, just as the police were showing up? In the years since, there's been seven rotating theories surrounding Jack and Bobby Kennedy, the CIA, the mafia, and Marilyn Monroe. The first came to light in 1964, when anti-communist writer Frank Capel suggested in his book, The Strange Death of Marilyn Monroe, that Robert Kennedy had her killed to cover up their love affair. Apparently, Capel's book was important enough to warrant a memo from the FBI to Robert Kennedy. In that memo, the FBI informed Robert that Capel's book made allegations about their affair and that Robert was there the night she died. In 1975, writer Anthony Scaduto, who's written acclaimed biographies about Bob Dylan, Frank Sinatra, and Mick Jagger, he posed a new theory. In his book, Who Killed Marilyn Monroe?, Anthony suggests that Robert Kennedy had her killed over a secret diary. Now, Marilyn wrote down all sorts of sensitive information she overheard during her time with the Kennedys, and that didn't sit well with the acting attorney general. Anthony's theory also like blends in the death of Jimmy Hoffa and how all roads lead back to Robert Kennedy. In Goddess, Anthony Summers suggests that Robert Kennedy broke off their affair Marilyn freaked out. She's calling all these places. She's making a big fuss. He didn't like it that she's threatening to go public. So he and his brother-in-law opted to stage her suicide. Now, it's a widely accepted fact that Peter was the last person she spoke with over the phone. He says he called to invite her to a party that night, and she sounded so out of it that he got worried. And her last words to him were allegedly, say goodbye to Pat's, his wife, say goodbye to the president, and say goodbye to yourself because you're a nice guy. As that theory goes, Peter and Bobby Kennedy enabled her prescription drug use to the point that she overdosed, and then Marilyn died on her way to the hospital. But again, where are the capsules in her stomach? But in this theory, the two men got FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover's help to hush it all up, bring her back to her house, and stage the suicide. But what would J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI want with Marilyn Monroe? Well, in 2012, the Associated Press, through a Freedom of Information Act request, got their hands on Marilyn Monroe's FBI file. Oh yeah, they're keeping close tabs on her. She was always left-leaning and very free-spirited, which at the time put her on Hoover's radar as a potential communist, because of course. And her marriage to playwright Arthur Miller, who's famous for works like The Crucible and Death of a Salesman, well, that wasn't helping her I'm not a communist case at all. The AP got their hands on a piece of Arthur's file too. And in 1956, the New York Daily News received an anonymous tip that he was a communist party member and the group's cultural front man. Now, he and Marilyn's marriage was called a cover-up and Monroe herself had drifted into communist orbit. 
So, did the FBI see Monroe as a threat and decide to take her out? A cultural icon beloved by the world with left-leaning views who could influence everyone who was so enamored with her? I mean, (laughs) they'd kill Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. later that decade, allegedly. So who's to say that Marilyn wasn't the first domino in a long line of coordinated assassinations perpetuated by the United States government? Oh my God, don't you love a good conspiracy theory? Now, Matthew Smith, in his book, Victim, The Secret Tapes of Marilyn Monroe, takes the government assassination theory a step further. He suggests that the CIA knew about Marilyn and Kennedy because at this point, come on, who doesn't? And they killed her to get back at Kennedy for the Bay of Pigs fiasco. But what if the CIA had something to do with it? And instead of using their own agents, they simply use their go-to street thugs, the mafia. In their book, Double Cross, The Inside Story of the Mobster Who Controlled America, authors and Chicago Mafia insiders Chuck and Sam Giancana talk about how their brother and godfather, Sam Giancana, the king of organized crime in Chicago and Sam's namesake, how he had a hand in Castro, Kennedy, and Monroe. Now, this theory follows a similar storyline that Marilyn was about to go public about her and Robert's relationship among other sensitive government secrets So Sam and his family accepted the contract on her life and did the job. They broke into Marilyn's home shortly after Robert left on the night of August 4th. They pinned her down and like a team of skilled surgeons inserted a rectal suppository filled with barbiturates enough to kill her. The ex-mobsters write about how the fast-acting suppository was the perfect delivery method because it left no needle marks and the whole thing just looked like she overdosed. According to Chuck, the secret would have died with his brother, but before Sam was gunned down in 1975, he confided in him about how he killed Marilyn Monroe. And Chuck passed that story down to his son, Sam, saying it's part of American history, a part which the government seems determined to hush up. It's also suggested that Giancana ordered the hit on Marilyn to get back at Robert Kennedy and his crusade against the mob. All roads really do lead back to Bobby Kennedy. Among the most plausible theory is that Marilyn Monroe was an early victim of the opioid crisis. She died of an accidental overdose after lying to her doctors about her current prescriptions. At the time, actresses like her were plied with all sorts of drugs to keep them thin and attentive. Studio doctors were handing out pills like Halloween candy, and HistoryNet quotes one 20th Century Fox doctor as saying, pills were seen as another tool to keep the stars working. The doctors were caught in the middle. If one doctor would not prescribe, there was always another one who would. Now, during an interview with Ben Hecht, a Hollywood screenwriter, Marilyn called herself the kind of girl they find dead in a hall bedroom with an empty bottle of sleeping pills in her hands. Finally, there's the fan favorite theory that JFK told Marilyn Monroe about aliens and UFOs and the government had them both killed before they could leak the information. Now, the theory even made its way into the second half of American Horror Story, double feature. In a scene from episode eight, Inside, we see JFK and Monroe lying in bed and talking casually about a deal between the U.S. and the aliens. It's a good one. Everybody with a typewriter and a book deal claimed to be an expert on Marilyn Monroe and all the theories surrounding her death. But ultimately, the truth probably died with the Kennedys, Hoover, Giancana, and her doctors. And since nobody wants to believe the official story they're trying to sell us, Marilyn Monroe will remain at the center of every conspiratorial conversation, forever young, for generations to come. But what do you think? Who killed Marilyn Monroe? And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.